Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the military coup and future of democracy in Myanmar. Before we begin, we will have the introductory message of President Son Yeol of EAI. Good afternoon. My name is Son Yeol from EAI. Thank you once again for your participation despite your busy schedules. All of the distinguished guests, the panelists, as well as Mr. Suk Jung Lee, senior fellow, and of course our audience online and offline. We also have some audiences that are uh, joining us online from overseas, so thank you very much. So we are now looking at the military coup and future of democracy in Myanmar. EAI was looking into this uh, subject from 2015 onwards. It's been six years in order to build the capacity of the civilian society in Myanmar. We have been conducting various different projects and with five NGOs in Myanmar. We have been supporting them as a think tank, uh, sharing our experiences and know-how. And through that, we were building their capacity. And then for, for the forward, we supported the growth of the civilian market for democracy in Myanmar. We have been cooperating with them on various different levels. So that's what we call de democratic cooperation. Not only did we share our experiences of democratization in Korea, but from last year and this year, we also wanted to share experiences uh, of participation of the people after the election or the general election in Myanmar. And so for that program, we were working with uh, the people in Myanmar, um, teaching them statistics as well as uh, survey tactics and skills. And after the civilian government stepped in, we conducted the survey. We were preparing the presentation of the post-general election survey, but the February 1st coup uh, broke out. So it was very difficult to have a joint seminar with those in Myanmar. So that is why uh, we are looking into uh, looking into possible ways for the international community to preserve democracy and to work together. So this conference is the first step in that direction. The presentation on the post-general election survey in Myanmar 2020 was the gist of our uh, events. Uh, so we will take part in presenting uh, the survey. And then afterwards, we are looking into challenges of Myanmar's democratic transition and possible ways of the international community cooperation. Korea, along with the international society, are seeking for ways to support Myanmar, and I believe that we will be able to have fruitful discussions today. Through the coup, to this time around, we will look at the various ways of how the coup has brought, shed a light on the overall status of Myanmar, and it has been now placed on the chopping board. And we will be looking at how to to sustainably uh, continue on with the democratization in Myanmar. Not only that, but also looking back at our democratization process with the hurtful uh, event of the Gwangju movements, um, we are now going to be interna internalized and, of course, build into the trust of uh, the democratization process. And it will be a way for us to reflect back on uh, our past as well. 
Based on this prospect, our conference will be talking about the post-general election survey as well as the, uh, what has happened during the election and the responses of Korea as well as the international community. Then, uh, looking into diplomatic ties from Korea and the international community and how to move forward in the future. Thank you once again for your participation, and I believe that our panelists will be able to provide their insight and knowledge, and I hope that it will be conducive to progressing on the discussion. There's also, uh, let's begin with our three fingers up and uh, saying, Save Myanmar. Thank you very much, President Son. We will now begin the first session, presentation on the post-general election survey in Myanmar. The first session will be looking at the capacity building program that the EAI has been doing for the past seven years, and it will be focusing on the final uh, post-general election survey. Our moderator will be Mr. Son Yeol, the president of EAI. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am uh, Son Yeol. So I'm saying hello to you once again. So I'm serving as a moderator for the first session. First session is about the presentations on the post-general election survey in Myanmar. And we'll have a discussion after uh, a uh, presentation. As I mentioned in the opening speech, we will make a presentation on the post-general election survey, and the survey was conducted uh, along with the five organizations in Myanmar. Uh, inavoidably, uh, we are uh, the uh, only one who is able to deliver uh, the presentations on the survey at the moment. And as you may know, um, today's speaker um, for the presentation is uh, Professor Jin Seok Pei, and there are other professionals uh, that we have invited for a discussion. And uh, those discussions, along with the presenter, have been working with uh, five organizations in Myanmar concerning uh, the uh, post general election survey, and they have had uh, 12 rounds of seminars with them. And uh, as a result, they, uh, was ab uh, they were able to conduct a uh, post-general election survey. However, in the meantime, uh, the coup took place. And uh, right after the coup, uh, the, uh, some of the members of the organization did contact us. And uh, they said, the results of the survey uh, were completely different from uh, the uh, allegations made by the military authority of Myanmar. And a few days later, and also we got a, a contact uh, once again from partnering organizations in Myanmar, and uh, they said that actually it is desirable for us to make a presentations on the results of the survey, and that is the best way to promote uh, democracy in Myanmar. So as a partnering organization, uh, we are more than willing to uh, disclose the results of the survey and have a discussion. So uh, based upon the request by Myanmar organizations, the first briefing about the survey results was made as of uh, uh, February 16. 
And um, today's meeting is a kind of a follow-up meeting, but uh, we'd like to present the uh, results of the survey in a full swing. So as I mentioned, the presentations will be made by Professor Chin Seok Pei of Gyeongsang National University. So about 20 minutes will be spent by the presenter. And uh, Professor Pei uh, will make a presentation online. That will be followed by Mr. Hanu Jong, senior research fellow of Hanguk Research, and he will spend about uh, 10 minutes, and that will be followed by Mr. Jun Yong Chang, professor of Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Probably at the end of the sessions, we'll have about 15 minutes uh, left. So during the time, we'd like to get some questions uh, online or would like to share uh, the feedback that we have received. Then, so I'd like to give the microphone to uh, Professor Chin Seok Pei. Hello, uh, Professor Pei. So uh, about 20 minutes will be given to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Jin Seok Pei, professor at Gyeongsang University. Um, I hope that you will understand that I am uh, delivering the presentation online. Before I begin my presentation, I would like to pay my respects to all of the people in Myanmar who have been sacrificed during the coup. And I will always stand by with them in their fight. So now I would like to share my screen for the PowerPoint presentation. So the contents of my presentation will be divided into three parts. First of all, uh, President Sun also mentioned the capacity building project of the EAI. I will briefly touch on that. And then I will move on to the post-general election survey of 2020, how that was prepared and implemented. And I'm sure that this is the subject that everyone is curious about. Uh, I will look into the coup of Myanmar, how the citizens are uh, seeing or what kind of opinions they have, and then um, moving on to the forecast of democratization. As was introduced, this is the capacity building project for the civilian society and EAI, and it's been seven years. So we started in 2015. We started back in 2014, but then in 2015, we had around 30 different workshops and conferences. At the time, uh, former President Suk Jong Lee uh, had started this off as uh, EAI's civilian think tank, um, sharing our experiences with the Myanmar society. And I also have various different experiences from that period. I did learn a lot. and. It wasn't just about spreading our experiences, but we also learned a lot from Myanmar because it's very authoritarian. And if you think about the social activists in those kinds of countries, we had a lot to learn. We looked into how uh, to perform networking activities, um, trying to share our experiences, um, also trying to relay web services as well as uh, other capacity building aspects. We also looked into uh, the methodology of the survey and how to write up a report data analysis, as well as the survey itself. So these were some areas that we studied into. So now moving on to the actual survey and the presentation of that survey result. 
This was led by uh, the civil society of Myanmar, and it was the first uh, survey of its kind led by the civil society in Myanmar. For the past seven years, EAI had been preparing for this, and we also had two major uh, election surveys, and we looked into the best way to conduct the survey. We thought that it should be led by the civil society in Myanmar. They had to be able to stand up on their own two feet and look into their own internal problems. So we wanted them to take the lead. So um, our utmost goal was, for was to have our Myanmar partners take the leadership role in the survey. Of course, there were various different structured um, surveys, but this time around it was more about the post-general elections. And then the second one was more about the overall process of uh, starting the elections and then um, gauging the sentiment after the election. So there were three major parts in terms of the theory. It was about the policy theory, uh, the act of voting itself, as well as the election. Uh, and then second, it was more about uh, capacity building of uh, the survey, how to build the survey itself, the methodologies, sampling, data analysis, and then the lastly, we also looked into the survey and the questionnaires itself. They were most curious about the forecast of democ democracy in Myanmar, so that's why they had drawn up those questions themselves. And then I went into the website, uh, the home page, and looked into what kind of different subjects we had been uh, looking at for the workshops. Last year in January, Mr. Tong han myself, and the EAI staff got together, and we had the workshop in uh, Myanmar. And then afterwards, because of COVID-19, we had to transition the workshop online. As you can see, this is a lesson about the sampling and how to build the statistical analysis program. And Korea Research also uh, had provided us with much support, and thank you once again for your efforts. There's a lot of uh, debate uh, regarding the fairness of uh, the general elections in 2020, so it was really about the conflict between the Myanmar military and USBDP. There were uh, allegations that the list of el uh, eligible voters uh, that amounted to about 860 counts were non-conclusive and that they were not the same as the list. And that is why there were allegations of uh, manipulation of the election. And last year in December and this year in uh, January, there was a watchdog. There were watchdog organizations at home and abroad did confirm that there were some discrepancies in uh, the lists and the voters, but then it was not significant enough to overturn or over overhaul the election itself. Nevertheless, even with these announcements, uh, the coup uh, arose on February 1st. And then afterwards, I'm sure that you are well aware of what had happened with uh, people in Myanmar, with civilians uh, going to the streets. Of course, we 
get a lot of information through the media about their fight and their struggle. However, we wanted to really listen to the voices of the people and what they thought about the general elections. So this is right after the general election and right before the a coup. We made the decision that our uh, survey will be able to gauge the overall understanding of the Myanmar people's uh, thoughts on uh, the general election. So let me just briefly go through the, the process and the uh, analysis. We were going to do a nationwide uh, survey. However, due to COVID-19, it was realistically difficult to, to do so. So we only looked into the Mandalay region and the Kachin state. So these two were the focus of our survey. And of course, the first city, Yangon, uh, was part of the survey. And there were uh, certain issues with the sampling. So that is why we focused on the Mandalay region and the Kachin state. So we did an interview analysis. And through a sampling method, we had a structured outline of uh, the survey. So for the Mandalay region, we had 450. And for Kachin state, we had uh, 758 respondents. The Mandalay region is the central uh, administrative region of Myanmar. So it's known as the second largest city. Um, in Mandalay, and there's a lot of influence of the NLD. From the House of Representatives, they have 35 seats out of 36, and for the upper house, they take 12 seats out of the 12. So the majority of uh, the Myanmar people are uh, Buddhist, and so it has high influence of the Burmese as well as uh, Buddhism. So the pro-NLD is uh, the mainstream of uh, Mandalay region. Now let's look at the Kachin state. It's in the northern part of Myanmar, and it's on the borderline with China. Relatively speaking, uh, there's less of an influence of the NLD party. 13 seats out of 18 are uh, taken by the NLD and the lower house or the House of Representatives. And of course, there's also very um, influenced by uh, the opposition party. After the Shan state, which has the majority influence of the opposition party, it's uh, Kachin state is the second one after the Shan state that has uh, a lot of influence by the opposition. And there's a lot of variety in terms of the people as well as the uh, religion. So you can see that the Kachin state is mostly dominated by uh, anti-NLD party members as well as the non-mainstream groups. Under the circumstances in which we could not have a nationwide survey, we looked into these two different areas and, of course, the support rate of uh, the NLD candidates. If you look at the responders and the portion in Mandalay, about 77% or nearly 80% of the respondents had supported an NLD a candidate for Kachin. It was a 45% to 50% of respondents supporting NLD party members or the candidates from there. So you can see the drastic, uh, contrast, drastic contrast between the two regions. Now uh, let's take a look at the matters whether uh, the election was fair or not. 
So as you see, uh, the slide uh, in both regions, uh, respondents uh, positively evaluated uh, the election, and uh, most of them they evaluated that uh, the recent 2020 general elections uh, gave uh, equal opportunities to all voters, and it was a democratic election based on a multi-party system. So uh, the results of the survey um, are valid uh, not only in the Mandalay uh, region, but also actually can uh, it it is applied to the Kachin state. Let's uh, take a look at the results more in details. And uh, nearly 90% of the respondents uh, in the Mandalay region said uh, the uh, election was free and fair. And there were some respondents who uh, gave a neutral answer. However, uh, the majority of them answered positively about the election. And what about the Kachin state? We can uh, figure out the same trend here. And uh, so we asked our questionnaire items like there was no uh, pressure uh, at the polls. And we asked questions related to the process of election. And uh, so we also figured out uh, how much they're satisfied with the uh, election results. So regarding these items, more than 90% uh, of the respondents said uh, they think that actually there was no pressure at the polls and they are satisfied with the election process. Uh, how, uh, for example, regarding satis uh, satisfaction level of the results of the survey, about 77% of the respondents in the Kachin state, uh, they said they are uh, satisfied. But as I mentioned um, uh, in the earlier slide, uh, about just 50% of respondents uh, supported uh, the NLD. Despite so, uh, their um, evaluation of the recent general election was quite positive, as you see the numbers and figures here. And this is about the um, the results of the survey for the Kachin state, and this is the breakdown of voters by different party. For sure, those who supported uh, the NLD, um, most of them uh, actually they answered that they were satisfied with the election process. But what um, attracted our attention was the numbers and figures concerning voters who uh, vote for who support for uh, who support the uh, opposition party so we asked uh, them questions uh, how they uh, thought of the election process and also we looked at supporters for usdp usdp is the opposition party so we tried to figure out uh, what are the differences between uh, these uh, two different or three different kinds of voters and you can make a comparison between blue and pink. So uh, out of 780 respondents, about eight, uh, 180 respondents were uh, the supporters of the KSPP, but uh, more than 88% of them, they said uh, they were satisfied with the election. And uh, also, 62% of them, they mentioned they were said uh, they trust the results of the election. And uh, the same trend uh, went to the USDP supporters, and 63.5% of the USDP supporters, they said that they are satisfied with the election process. And 68.3% uh, of them, they uh, said they trust uh, the uh, results of the election. As shown in these slides, so when it comes to the results of the election, um, most or m the, the majority of the uh, citizens in uh, Myanmar, they are satisfied, satisfied with uh, the election process. And also, uh, when we take a look at the respondents who support for LLD, um, most of them, they uh, said they were satisfied with the election process and also they trust the results of the uh, election. This indicates that the allegation made by the military is, a compl is completely different from uh, the public sentiment of uh, Myanmar. 
Yes, that's right. Uh, the election was fair. Uh, however, so I'd like to uh, sh sh uh, give highlights on uh, some of the characteristics of the uh, public sentiment concerning Myanmar. So uh, one of the uh, questions th that we wanted to tackle in the survey uh, was, uh, is Myanmar going into the right direction? So we made a comparison between the two regions in case of uh, but the Mandalay region, about 85% of them, uh, they answered that uh, Myanmar was uh, going into the right direction. And about 2% of them, a small portion of them, they said a no to that statement. And the rest of the respondents said um, either they don't know uh, or they did not respond. And so let's take a look at the results of the uh, survey of the Kachin state. So about 44% of the respondents said that actually Myanmar was going into the right direction. Uh, and 41.9% uh, of the respondents, they said uh, they don't know. What does it mean? Most of the uh, supporters of NLD in uh, Mandalay region, actually, they think that actually uh, Myanmar was going into the right direction. But in case of uh, the Kachin state, more than 40% of the respondents, actually, they had some reservations about this um, question. So about 11% of them, they said uh, Myanmar was not going into the right direction. So uh, given these results, we could uh, see that um, the elected uh, new government might have many challenges to overcome. And also we can find uh, these findings also uh, through the other kinds of question there, uh, answers. Uh, so uh, there are different uh, portions for different uh, questions, but um, uh, those in the Kachin state, actually, they gave um, positive evaluations, as you see on the slide. But uh, regarding the questions of whether uh, they think that the new government will be able to revise the constitution, about 40 or less than 40 percent of the respondents said uh, that they believe that uh, the new government would do so. Looking at these results, the, uh, the second, uh, the civil government uh, before the coup, even before the coup, actually they had um, several challenges uh, to overcome ahead of them. And lastly, so we uh, tried to figure out how uh, the Myanmar citizens are perceiving about the need to need for uh, the international community's intervention. So as you know, minority groups' issues have um, attracted uh, the attention of the uh, uh, global community. And uh, as you see here, um, there are different um, respondents' uh, evaluation about the questions, and uh, but most of them, uh, they thought that there was a need for the international community to make interventions. And this has much implications on what needs to be done by the international community. So to sum up, uh, many of the uh, Myanmar citizens uh, thought that uh, the 2020 general election was fair and free, and uh, this indicates that uh, the military's allegations about uh, election fraud uh, was groundless. Uh, but and regarding uh, the question uh, whether uh, Myanmar was going into the right direction or not, and uh, many of the respondents uh, said yes. 
Um, and also regarding the uh, intervention of the international community, uh, many of the citizens said that they need uh, the international community's interventions. However, there seems uh, there still there are some reservations among uh, some of the uh, respondents. So uh, this is the uh, end of the summary of the survey results. And uh, so I'd like to conclude my presentation. So I'd like to have a, a general discussion with other panelists. Thank you. Uh, Professor Pae. So you uh, gave us a lot of details about the overall process of the survey and what happened and what kind of questions were asked in the survey. And we'll go uh, into the discussion right away. And we have invited uh, two panelists with us, Mr. Han Woo Chong, Senior Research Fellow of Hanguk Research. And as mentioned earlier, uh, he is the uh, general uh, public opinions a research uh, professional, and so regarding the matter, we'll have an in-depth discussion together. And another uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Chun Yong Chang, professor of the Hankook University of Korean Studies. And uh, to be honest with you, in fact, it is really uh, hard to find uh, any uh, expert uh, concerning Myanmar here in Korea. Despite so, these two uh, professionals actually they are dedicating themselves to uh, researching into Myanmar. So I'd like to give 10 minutes first to Mr. Chang, and then uh, microphone will be handed over to Mr. Chang. As was introduced, I am Hanul Chang from Korea Research. In fact, uh, I am uh, being introduced as Hanguk Research, but for the past 13 years, I was working at the EAI as a senior research fellow. So I actually visited uh, as the secretary general uh, Secretary Director um, to Myanmar and spoke with about 20 different organizations. What was quite impressive was the great divide between the different organizations. I only knew about how to uh, do the surveys. I knew that it would be conducive to some of the organizations, but about half of those organizations were composed of a very young uh, participants, and so that was very well received. And for a lot of the organizations that had been pr pursuing democratization movements for a long time, they weren't very on board with uh, these kinds of capacity building. It was before the 2015 elections. And at the time, uh, those surveys were restricted by the military. So they knew that it was very skeptical, or they felt that it was very skeptical to conduct these kinds of surveys. So the younger generation had a different perspective, whereas uh, the more conservative organizations were opposed to it. After the 2015 elections, and after it won by a landslide, a lot of different surveys just sprung up here and there. And you can see also uh, from some of the organizations mentioned, like PACE were uh, one of those who looked into the surveys mostly societal surveys. So at first, when we first went, there were a lot of criticisms and skepticism asking us whether a survey was actually necessary. However, because of uh, the military coup, in February, it's quite worrisome whether these surveys will be able to be held in the future. Today, I think that um, Professor Pei also already mentioned most of the aspects, so I will touch upon a little bit of the parts where our uh, organizations on the ground had difficulty in. 
I mean, on one hand, I believe that it's a bit, it doesn't really make sense whether we're um, talking about this in the situation with the military coup, but I think that we do need to look at the facts and the significance of the data. The program's already been introduced, so I will skip over that, but let's look at some of the other details. So it was the first uh, survey was conducted in 2019, um, satisfaction survey in the si Yangon city about their public services. And then in 2020, there was the second uh, survey related to the general elections. A lot of the organizations prefer uh, governance-related or policy-related surveys. So a lot of the survey questionnaires were regarding the political decisions of the new party. And we also wanted to expand that to diplomacy, looking at the U.S. and Sino relations. So there were some special issues. I think that we need to look into the methodology. So we used a random san sampling for both of the regions. For Mandalay, it was the PPS, or the population proportionate sampling. So it was proportionate to the population. And so we wanted to look at the probability of uh, the population or the pro in proportion to the population. And for Kachin, so it wasn't uh, exactly in line with our initial uh, thoughts, but I believe that there were still um, significant results with the multi-stage random sampling. So on the next page, you see Mandalay on the left-hand column and Katsin on the right-hand column. So for Mandalay, we had a very even base for males and females in terms of gender age as well. But for Kachin, if you look at the level of education, both regions had about 20% for uh, University Plus, or those who had uh, a level of education above university level. So you do have to consider that point, that it was quite a smaller uh, ratio. For Mandalay, the majority of the respondents were Buddhists, but for Kachin, there was uh, a lot of uh, Catholics and Christians, but I think that there may be a little bit of a discrepancy here. So after we did the sampling uh, learnings and the lectures, uh, I think that it was well reflected in the survey. And now let's look at some of the interesting results of the content. First of all, regarding the fairness of the election, I think that Professor Pei also mentioned about that. So on the next page, irregardless of the coup, regarding the general election, it's about the methodology or the action behavior about the voting itself. These are some valuable uh, data points that they can make use of. In Mandalay, it was mostly about the students in their 20s uh, who support the NLD, but it's not as much to be significant enough uh, statistically. And for those who are residing in the urban areas, they tended to support NLD. And now looking at Kachin State, as I mentioned before, uh, NLD won, uh, still won um, the majority votes. However, uh, you still have the USDP and the KSPP that take up a number of the seats. You have um, male 
in their 50s and higher who support NLD. But among the university and above education level, as well as white collar, they were uh, supporting NLDs, uh, KSBP, excuse me. A lot of the KSPP supporters were Christians, and uh, a lot of the NLD supporters were Buddhists. On the next page, let's just look at the most significant uh, factors regarding the gap between rural areas and urban areas. You have the urbanization or modernization theory. I think that that also applies here. And next, with the Kachin state, the ethnicity also had an effect on the voting. On the left-hand side, it's Kachin's ethnicity, uh, the spread of ethnicity. And then on the right-hand side, you have the voting behaviors of uh, each ethnicity. Of course, the second party or the opposition party is the USDP. So the non-Burmese or the second largest group of uh, ethnic uh, groups is the Jingbao, and they tended to support KSPP. As for Burmese, it was in the order of NLD, USDP, and KSPP. And next, this is the increase or decrease about the support for NLD. In Mandalay, compared to the 2015 and 2020 elections, you see a slight increase in the support for NLD. And on the right-hand side for Kachin, in state, the support rate of NLD tended to, to decrease. Just looking at the election itself, some of the reasons why there was a decrease in the support for NLD is something that, that needs further investigation. So in Mandalay, along with the support for NLD, they were quite optimistic about uh, democratization. However, if you look on the right-hand side, the pie chart, this is regarding the Kachin state. They were asked to rate the stability after the elections, and uh, they responded 34% stable and 48% not stable. So you can actually uh, foresee that there was some instability in uh, the market. And on the next page, Regarding these voting behaviors, we also wanted to look at the foreign uh, perspectives. Regarding FDI, there were very positive uh, perspectives in Mandalay that um, FDI creates more jobs as well as a better livelihood. And next, I think that this would be very interesting for um, people in diplomacy. In Mandalay, they selected uh, China with 65% as the country to be cautious in their relations, so careful relations. Uh, and then in Kachin, 61% of the respondents selected the United States over China in terms of support for uh, diplomatic relations. So these were some of the data points and some of the interesting points that were not disclosed. And with that, I'd like to conclude my part. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. If you have, uh, well, I think that we heard a lot of uh, additional comments from the survey. If you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A time and the uh, discussion time.
So I think that there were a lot of interesting uh, results and we'll be able to talk about it during this session and next session. Next, I will hand it over to Professor Chang. As introduced, I am uh, Professor Chang. So I listened uh, well to the presentation uh, by uh, the earlier uh, discussant. Personally, I think that actually there are not that many people who study uh, Myanmar, and it's really uh, such a great pleasure to see uh, you studying uh, about Myanmar. Personally, actually, I uh, conducted research in relations to general elections uh, two times in the past. And before I complete my paper, my thesis, I made a visit to uh, the country uh, to see how uh, the uh, local residents uh, perceive uh, the general elections and what are the strengths or weaknesses of NLD or USDP and uh, those kind of things uh, were uh, looked into by me. And still, there were remaining questions in my head, uh, but most of the uh, remaining questions were tackled uh, thanks to this uh, recent uh, survey conducted by e EAI. I don't have uh, any specific question to ask, but uh, I'd like to uh, give more complimentary content in relation to the survey. First of all, the Kachin State and the Malay uh, region uh, were selected for the survey, but in uh, the, their local language pronunciation, it is not Kachin, they call Kachin. They call it Kachin. Uh, in case of the uh, Malay region, uh, in the past, during the colonial days, uh, there were uh, many Western um, missionaries uh, who came in. Uh, so about 30% of the populations are Christians. And as mentioned by uh, Mr. Zhang already, there is a tribe called Chinguo, and in Myanmar we call Gachin, uh, but uh, the, uh, the group uh, related to the Gachin, they don't call themselves the Gachin tribe, and uh, the most numbers of uh, the members of the tribe that you can see in the states were and they use uh, ethnic, uh, different ethnic uh, names. And for example, the Jingpo uh, tribe, so except the Jingpo tribe, uh, most of the re uh, residents, local residents are Christians. And as for Gachin state, uh, in case of Myanmar, actually, there are administrative uh, states and there are also uh, autonomous states. Uh, but autonomous states mostly include uh, minorities or ethnic uh, groups. And I'd like to talk about the Mandalay region. And uh, the Mandalay region uh, includes the old capital city of the last dynasty. And also, even now, they have a capital city of the current times. And they also have, the region has a uh, specific city related to the military that is called Naxalia. So in terms of the demographics and in terms of the historical backgrounds, uh, the two regions are quite different from each other. So uh, given this, uh, it was interesting to me uh, that uh, these two different regions or areas were uh, chosen uh, for the survey. And uh, there was a one person who was in charge of uh, the election polls, and uh, that person actually made a report that uh, was running about 15 uh, pages, and uh, that pa uh, report was given to me. And according to the report, there was no election fraud. However, you know, uh, according to the authorities, uh, there were about 290 cases of uh, 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 election fraud, but even before the 2020 election, um, 
general elections. There were some uh, fabrication related uh, issues in the previous general elections. And there were inconsist inconsistencies in the voters register, uh, sometimes uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the uh, typing of uh, the names of the voters. Uh, there were some typos. And sometimes uh, some of the, uh, those who passed away were not registered on time. And also the uh, birth date registration uh, is not being done in the right manner. So that's why there were uh, inconsistencies in the electoral register. But in fact, many NGOs, even inside the, uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, they, ex they raised uh, suspicions about the fairness of the elections uh, in the past. Uh, the government of Myanmar uh, would have done, uh, could have done a better job if they uh, had paid enough attention to uh, the suspicions uh, raised by the NGOs, uh, local NGOs. And uh, what is important is that actually there is a bipolarization between political parties and it's not been it's not uh, long since uh, the political parties were established in the country. So at the moment, uh, there are so many uh, political parties. And for the recent uh, general elections, there were about 99 uh, political parties. However, less than 10 parties took seats in the House uh, or upper house and the lower house. And uh, out of them, uh, two major parties are NLD and USDP. So in the eyes of the general public, you no, know, it is either NLD or USDP. So there is a, like, a polarization, extreme polarization in the perceptions of the uh, general public regarding what kind of political parties they need to take. In the previous elections, like in 2010, in 2015, there were so many more political parties, so that uh, led to more confusion and chaos. Uh, but another uh, political party came up, so uh, it means that uh, there is a need for unifying more numbers of political parties in the future. So when it comes to the level of fairness evaluated by respondents in the past, you know, the, the satisfaction level was just 60%. However, uh, according to the recent survey results, it is more than 60%, so there is an improvement. And uh, one of the major points that I want to highlight, on, uh, keep highlight on is uh, the level of credibility or the level of trust. Uh, so uh, rather than political parties, uh, in most of the cases, uh, local residents actually, they uh, have a tendency to put more trust in a specific person. So NLD is advocating that they are the national party. However, uh, NLD is, uh, in fact, is more uh, pro Burmans. So even after the recovery of democracy, uh, we need uh, to um, address uh, many issues. So in the past, even before the coup, uh, there were not that many policies in favor of the minority groups. And uh, a few years ago, when there was elections in the local areas, in most of the cases, the NLD was defeated. So through the results of the survey, we should be able to read uh, what uh, would uh, be happening in the future, so what kind of measures uh, are needed for the future of Myanmar. So in that, uh, given that, uh, this uh, survey is really meaningful and significant because it can give some hints uh, at anticipating um, what uh, would play out in the future. So if you have a questions in the future, I really hope that you, know, you can uh, conduct surveys in other seats like Shan State. So in that case, I believe that you will be end up, you know, uh, finding more interesting stuff. Thank you.
So two panelists have presented their opinions that are really valuable. It seems that there is no question asked to the presenter. So we have about 10 minutes left for the first session. So I would like to take some questions from the floor. Or would like to take questions from online channel that we are using. First, are there any people who want to raise questions? And if you have any questions, please raise your hand uh, so that our staff member can hand the microphone to you. Is there anyone who has a question from the floor? Maybe you can have some time to think about it. So we have received one question online. Let me read the question. One of the discussions mentioned that there is a polarization in Myanmar. So it indicates that um, there was a sense of crisis even before the coup uh, for the democratic government. So after the uh, general election, upcoming general elections, what kind of change would happen in Myanmar, especially when it comes to uh, Myanmar's democracy? So there may be two different sides. If the military takes uh, power, then it will be a military-ruled uh, country. And the other side would probably be the option of having a civilian democracy. For in the first case scenario, the overall election process may be overhauled. I think that one of the cases uh, that they will try to benchmark is from Thailand. But if you look at the micro side, 25 percent of the National Assembly is allocated to the uh, military. So uh, apart from that, I think that they will try to uh, have the proportional representation. And they'll also have the minority parties or the regional parties that will be infiltrated into the central government. So the military party will probably be able to uh, take in their those parties. And in the second case scenario, if a democracy is revived and restored, I think that it's uh, quite a pessimistic scenario because uh, there's a lot of dependency on Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi. And there's no one to replace her at the moment. So the current uh, structure will probably be uh, maintained if Aung San Suu Kyi comes back into the party and into pa comes back into the ruling power, how they will overcome some of the issues that they had with Aung San Suu Kyi and some of uh, the mistakes and faults, um, I don't know. So even if democracy takes place again, I think that they will have to go through maybe an alternative party. Um, and when there is a, a successor to that role, then they will be able to really uh, have the democracy. Anyone uh, from the floor have a question? I have a question, in fact. So the coup this time around, was it already a foreseen uh, tragedy? If you think about the overall sentiment on the ground in Myanmar, um, first of all, what do you think um, whether it was already uh, destiny or what, was it something that it just happened? And a lot of the concerns related to the coup d'etat, have they really been worried about a coup in the past? And if you have any um, past experiences regarding this aspect, I'd like to ask you about it. I um, can 
ask this to Professor Bay, but I think that I will ask um, um, uh, Mr. Pei. Mr. Chong's. So in the process of preparing for the seminar, whether we actually felt that there could be a coup or not, I don't see, think that we saw any signs. It was more of the concerns about a faulted uh, election, especially in the Kachin state. There was a lot of skepticism and uh, distrust for fair elections. But even in January, it wasn't really about um, there, that there will be a coup. It was more about concerns over the fairness of an election. So that's why I was uh, taken aback and very surprised at the coup as well. But then I looked into the analysis results, but then there were some public sentiments that thought uh, or were concerned about um, the instability on the ground, on the field. So was the coup a foregone conclusion? So I'd like to tackle the question first. The coup uh, broke out uh, based on uh, the personal desires of Min Tang Hu, the, uh, the head of the military uh, authorities in Myanmar, and also there was another reason. And uh, as you know, whenever there is a coup by the military, the military has uh, been citing uh, the prevention of instability for the country as a reason for the coup. So uh, Myanmar is based on the federal system. So if the federal system is broken up, the uh, the, uh, the Gachin uh, tribe uh, may be incorporated into um, Thailand, and also the other uh, ethnic groups uh, could be absorbed into another country. So that kind of argument is uh, going on, and the military authority is um, convincing uh, people based on these arguments. So the coup uh, is justifying their coup, um, saying that um, it is aimed at preventing the division of the nation. But right after the coup, actually, uh, the military authority uh, formed uh, the fact-finding investigation committee, and uh, there was a discussion on uh, whether or not uh, foreigners needed to be included to the investigation committee. Uh, so th that happened a long time ago. Uh, so that was the times where the United Nations was uh, under Kapi Annan. But uh, in this case, um, the coup uh, took place recently, and uh, there will be a continuous pressure uh, that uh, would be put on uh, the military authorities. So the, even the military authority has uh, some challenges to tackle. In fact, before they took an action, it is true that they had a few uh, meetings or occasions with the uh, democratic government or the civil government. And according to the media, even before the coup, there was uh, some kind of a, a negotiation meeting between the, the military authorities and the NLD party. But uh, the coup took place uh, majorly, uh, yeah. primarily because the NLD did not accept uh, the power of the military. Thank you very much for your answers. Now it's about uh, time to end, but uh, we have received two questions online. So these two questions, I believe that um, will be better to be addressed uh, in the next sessions, but I'd like to uh, let you know what kind of questions came up. In case of a failure of democracies in Myanmar, uh, what uh, kind of implications does it have to the international politics? So that uh, was the first question. And the second question is, so please um, open the screen uh, further so that I can see it better. So uh, how should uh, the Myanmar democracy be interpreted uh, in the regional context? 
So those were the questions asked online, and these questions will be addressed in the next session. So this concludes session one. As I mentioned earlier, the session one was about uh, presenting the post-rental election survey results uh, that was done in collaboration uh, between the EAI and uh, civil society organizations in Myanmar. So that was really significant and meaningful. So this ends the first question, uh, session. And um, concluding the session, please hold your three fingers up. Standing up, stand up, please. Wishing for saving Myanmar. Thank you. This concludes uh, the first session under the title of the presentations on the post-general election survey in Myanmar. We'll have a break, so a 20-minute break, and that will be followed by the second session. We will now begin the second session. The subject is challenges of Myanmar's democratic transition and possible ways for the international community to preserve a democracy. So related to this long-term goal, Korea will provide a mission as well as the discussion. We will conduct a roundtable discussion and it will be moderated by Professor Suk Jung Lee, Senior Fellow of EAI. Hello, I am uh, Suk Jung Lee, moderator of the second session. In Korea, if you talk about Myanmar, a lot of the older or senior residents remember it as Burma. And because of the military rule for a long time, for countries who uh, favor or put emphasis on democ democracy, they still call it Burma. There are so many uh, commonalities. They gained independence in 1948, and they have 53 million in terms of population. And even with the coup d'etat, um, there's only one year of a difference uh, compared to Korea. Early on in the early 70s, there were requests for democracy, and then it was similar to the Yushin uh, system in, uh, in Korea as well. They also had the fight for independence in 1988, but that wasn't relayed onto a democracy. As you may know, in 1987, with the new constitution, uh, we have been able to solidify our democracy. So we started together, but at the end of the 1980s, we have gone into different directions in terms of democracy, and they weren't able to get the recognition for the win in the 1990s with the election. And under a compromise uh, between the military as well as uh, the civilian government, they have a pact, pacted democracy, as we call it. In 2015, it was a landslide victory for NLD and 2020 as well. But nevertheless, they have incurred a military coup in February 1st uh, this year. There have been a lot of casualties as of today. I'm not sure what the number stands at the moment, but it has gone over 700 casualties, especially the younger generation and the students. Um, so it's very heart-wrenching to hear. 
In this section, uh, it's not really about discussing the electoral uh, democracy, but it's rather how to normalize uh, the current status of the military coup and how democracies such as ours will be able to support Myanmar. So we have a couple of panelists here with us. I have uh, basic resumes of uh, the panelists, so I will just uh, mention the name and their affiliation and what kind of theme they will be talking about. First of all, uh, Professor Nong Park of Songgonghae University will be talking about the democratic transition of Myanmar and its structural problems, why Myanmar is having such a difficult time. And then the next, we have senior fellow Taehyun Lee, the Asian Institute for Policy Studies, talking about military coup in Myanmar and ASEAN's solidarity to protect the people. So the 10 countries in ASEAN, um, or nine countries apart from Myanmar, will uh, support uh, Myanmar, and um, he will be talking about how to do so. And uh, Professor Hyun Hyunjun Kim of Korea University will talk about a diplomacy of governance and democratic values and ways to support Myanmar's democratization from the Korean perspective. And last but not least, maybe it's because of the overlap with the Gwangju incident. A lot of the civil society organizations are uh, supporting the democratization movement in Myanmar. So on, in that aspect, uh, Mr. Hyun Yun Lee, the international program officer at the Korea Democracy Foundation, will talk about reactions of the Korean government and civil society organizations. And then we have two discussants. On my left-hand side, uh, leader Wei Nui Huynh So uh, from the Youth Action for Myanmar. Uh, she's very good in uh, speaking Korean, so I don't think that she'll need a separate interpreter. We also have Mr. Uh, Hyun Jin Pei from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs, who will be talking about his perspective. So first of all, I would uh, give, like to give you 10 minutes for your presentations, uh, Professor Park. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation for EAI. I have 10 minutes, so I would like to briefly read uh, what I have uh, submitted. So Myanmar is at a crisis once again. The NLD civilian government led by Aung San Suu Kyi uh, had its second term and prior to that, the military and Min, led by Min Aung Hlaing was the one that corrupted the government. So the military is mentioning that it's a legal transition of power based on the Constitution. As a result, the NLD slash uh, military is instable or unstable marriage uh, has resulted in an orderly uh, transition, and they had uh, declared an end to this orderly transition. The military alleged that the NLD uh, won in a corrupted elections for 2020 in November and declared it null. And the, even during the 1990 general elections, they did not recognize or acknowledge the landslide victory of NLD, and they participated in a veto coup. So this is another military veto coup in 30 years. This uh, orderly transition is based on the Constitution, and the military of Myanmar Myanmar refers to the pacted democratization. The trigger of the 
agreement was back in 2011, August 18th, with the then President Thein Sein and Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of NLD. And as a result, the core of the agreement was the NLD providing the interruption or participation of the military and they, that they would accept the 2008 constitution. On the other hand, the military will also be able to take part in the government. So this constitution passed in 2008 uh, is actually centered on the military rule, which ruled from 1988 to 2011. The Constitution back in 2008 was to prevent uh, the military from losing everything as a result of a major failure from the general election in 1990. So in 2003, according to the seven-step democratization roadmap, this was formed. So to this end, the administration is is looking at the military under the Ministry of Defense, uh, police in the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and of course the border control under the Ministry of Borders. So you have these three agencies and 25% of the seats at the National Assembly are allocated to the military. So this kind of legal coup is stipulated in Article 11, Clause 417, and if a president declares a state of an emergency, then the overall power is to be transitioned over to the military. So this is what Min Aung Hlaing is mentioning as a legal transition. However, with uh, the president being detained, and the military head declaring emergency, they, in fact, have been violating the Constitution of 2008. This legal uh, issue is, in fact, um, just a one-sided opinion. Min Aung Hlaing has uh, conducted the military coup with the military hardliners, negating the result of the November elections in 2020, and has overhauled the Aung San Suu Kyi and Tain Sein agreement. So, the 298 National Assembly members elected through the general election and they formed uh, an emergency committee, the committee representing Pi Dang Su Hudlao, and they actually requested that it would not uh, accept this. And of course, uh, they have negated the fact that they have violated the 2008 uh, Constitution. Myanmar has experienced a socialist regime and also uh, a prolonged and inconclusive political struggle to step into democratization. The first step of transition was a political opening and it was actually going over the uh, doorsteps of freedom or independence. And then now it was concluded after um, creating democracy for themselves. In the freedom stage, um, political criminals were released and, of course, the overall censorship was alleviated. And in 2012, April 1st, they had the side elections, and it's actually the peak of uh, their uh, freedom. And at the time, Aung San Suu Kyi was elected from the NLD, and uh, they took 44 seats, or the majority of the seats at the National Assembly. And then uh, finally, in 2015, with the landslide victory of NLD, this was actually moving from a restricted, regulated democracy to the demo democracy of the people, and it was a critical election in their history. So elections peacefully resolve a political conflicts, and it's a policy that actually uh, makes available for political negotiations. So it's uh, an essential 
element to create a disarmed democracy. And so the loser or those who fail at the election have to succumb to the results and they look forward to the next election. Samuel Huntington mentioned in the electoral democracy, the leaders have to internalize a democracy and trust in uh, the, the politics as a zeitgeist. However, the Myanmar military mentions the discipl discipline flourishing democracy, mentioning no discipline, no democracy. This is a strong support to the 2008 Constitution and the seven-step democracy roadmap released in 2003 is also pointing towards the regulatory democracy. However, the victory of the NLD in 2015 and 2020 and the failure of the USDP is crumbling down the walls of the regulatory democracy that was built by the military and uh, also made hopes for the representative uh, democracy. But this coup has really faced opposition to uh, the zeitgeist of uh, scaling up democracy. Huntington also mentioned the general clauses of uh, democracy that specific countries or their democracies is the result of those unique elements in that country. What we have to focus on is that those general clauses only create the basis for democracy, but it's not a critical factor for democracy. So once again, it's not about the causes, it's more about the causers that create uh, the democracy, such as the political leaders and the public. In particular, those leaders in the military rule have to reflect the zeitgeist and their critical element for democracy is this element right here. So the military coup in Myanmar that started in February 1st is, is uh, looking at the semi-disarmed uh, democracy that have to control the Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Defense, and Ministry of Border Control. And they also have to uh, transition into the representative democracy. And it's the result of the conflict between those who support and those who are against. Therefore, this is about the strategy of divide and conquer ever since the 2015 uh, success, success of the NLD civil government. So this is a failure of uh, creating a military revolutionist. So the strategy of creating defectors within the military is still significant in the current status of a crisis. Thank you very much for your comment. Now moving on to our next uh, presenter, yeah, Professor Jaehyun Lee. Thank you for the uh, introduction. So let me first take off my mask. I don't have a good voice originally, but you know, if I speak uh, with uh, the mask on, uh, that's not going to be good uh, to listen to. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about the military coup in Myanmar and ASEAN solidarity to protect the people. Uh, but I'd like to tell you is that actually um, ASEAN has a long history since uh, 19. Uh, 54, oh no, sorry, it's, it's been uh, 54 years since the establishment of ASEAN, so ASEAN has a, such a long history. However, still, uh, there is a far more distance uh, gap between the EU and uh, the ASEAN. So I'd like to talk about uh, how uh, ASEAN countries are responding to the recent coup in Myanmar and what kind of efforts is 
is being uh, made uh, in order to tackle the problem. And uh, so at the national level or at the individual national level and at the global level, what kind of things need to be done? So the future scenarios we talked about as well. So this time again, um, they uh, ASEAN uh, applied their way, ASEAN way, the so-called ASEAN way, meaning that actually there is a principle of non-interruptions uh, with regard to the issues and the problems in other countries. If they don't have the capability to raise their voice over them, they uh, apply the principle of non-interruption. So they hide themselves behind the matter. And as soon as um, the coup took place in uh, Myanmar, Malaysia and Singapore, they responded to that matter first. Uh, both of the nations um, called for the peaceful re resolutions of the problems um, of the uh, in, in Myanmar. And also the ASEAN uh, chair country made an official statement asking for the peaceful resolutions of the matter. And in initial stages after the coup, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Thailand, those countries uh, said that they would not make any interventions on uh, the Myanmar coup issue because they are not uh, their internal matters. And the second statement was issued by other countries, and some of the countries even mentioned about the need to release uh, the detained people by the military authorities, and they raised concerns about uh, violence, violent suppressions against the protesters. However, no ASEAN country pointed out uh, the problem uh, that uh, military authority uh, is causing a problem or causing a crisis in that country. And but it was a meeting between foreign ministers between uh, ASEAN countries. Uh, that kind of diplomatic effort uh, took place. However, that did not result in any fruitful results. And there was an emergency meeting in early March, uh, online meeting. And according to the statement issued after the meeting, so when you take a look at the statement, um, it is there are interesting parts. So that was issued as of uh, the 2nd of March. So Brunei is the chair country of ASEAN. So uh, the report is talking about uh, the chairmanship of Brunei. And they make an evaluation of uh, the results made so far. And also the report uh, states uh, the responses made uh, by countries concerned Concerning COVID-19, but there is a little bit of comment about Myanmar. But they just saying that um, there are there are concerns about civilians, and uh, there is no no significant um, criticism against the uh, military coup or military authority in Myanmar. So there was no not that much uh, talking about uh, victims of the coup. In case of the current government, uh, the current government uh, issued a, a statement uh, as of uh, 3rd of uh, February. And um, the South Korean government uh, took some measures uh, to go against uh, the military coup in Myanmar. Uh, compared to what was done by Korea, uh, the level of actions uh, taken by the ASEAN countries was uh, much weaker. So uh, to sum up, it can be said that uh, many of the ASEAN countries are lukewarm when it comes to responding to the matter in uh, Myanmar, and but this is not the first time for the ASEAN countries to do that. So back in 1980s, uh, ASEAN uh, countries uh, did the same. For example, there was a controversy back uh, in the old days regarding the joining of Myanmar to ASEAN, but the uh, European Union uh, resisted uh, or made an objection about the idea of making uh, the Myanmar uh, join uh, the ASEAN. Uh, but despite the criticism by the international commu community, ASEAN countries decided to accept Myanmar um, to uh, their association 
Association saying that it's better to bring in bring them in in order to make a change in the country. And a few years later, from that time, um, there was a plan uh, to give uh, ASEAN chairmanship to uh, Myanmar, but that sparked another controversy, and uh, there were a lot of uh, countries outside of ASEAN um, sparking a controversy, uh, saying that they cannot give uh, any chairmanship to uh, Myanmar. However, ASEAN countries made a lot of discussions and negotiations with Myanmar, so uh, eventually Myanmar made a decision on its own through the negotiation with ASEAN. That decision was to skip their chairmanship. Uh, so, uh, as uh, seen in these examples um, of the past, ASEAN has never taken any active uh, posture or uh, stance on um, the matters uh, that uh, take place in Myanmar. So the ASEAN countries are, are lukewarm and they are not very active in dealing with the issue or what is happening in, Mi in Myanmar. So the so-called ASEAN way has uh, limitations, clearly. So uh, they don't uh, voice their opinions about uh, human rights infringements and many other issues that are happening. And also one of the limitations uh, that ASEAN has uh, is that actually they don't have a binding uh, you know, means, uh, legally binding means. So it, it is just serving as a forum. Maybe that can serve as a lame excuse for them, but uh, in the meantime, for the regional issues, ASEAN countries has a tendency to address their internal problems in a subtle manner, not uh, speaking up um, to the outside world. So uh, at this point or uh, at the moment, uh, what seems reasonable is this. For example, until 2011, ASEAN uh, countries have been talking together with the military regimes of Myanmar uh, in the negotiating uh, tables. And even now, uh, there are many chances for ASEAN to have a dialogue with the military authority even after the recent coup. And that was evident also in the past. So uh, after some problems broke up and just ASEAN just um, absorbed the problem and they just uh, invite the military team to the negotiating table or the dialogue table. Uh, so um, back in the old days uh, when uh, the international community gave pressure to ASEAN, it seemed that, that ASEAN was um, felt a lot of pressures and uh, they were like, you know, trying to uh, make a little bit of change. However, at the, uh, in the end, they did not make a big change. So I think that this time it is uh, less likely for ASEAN countries to make a big change in responding to Myanmar. And now um, I would like to hand the microphone over to Professor Han Jun Kim of Korea University. So I have uh, selected uh, a diplomacy of governance and democratic values and ways to support Myanmar's democratization of the Korean perspective. Um, in order to discuss this, we have to think about the overall framework of the international politics and, of course, uh, the backgrounds. There's a lot of uh, perspectives. Uh, first, unfriendly and the friendly versions. The first, unfriendly versions include uh, because of uh, humanitarian issues, violences, and the rule of law, as well as populism. And in the midst of the U.S. Sino conflicts, um, former Pre President Donald Trump has also mentioned about the uh, human rights issues and 
However, there are some friendly perspectives as well with the new administration, with the new Biden administration. There is a lot of focus on value diplomacy that places focus and importance on uh, human rights and democracy. And for the past decade, there have also been a lot of discussions on human rights, accountability, and transitional justice, as well as responsibility to protect uh, people. And there's a lot of uh, tools in order to uh, create a democracy. The current status of Myanmar, I think you know very well, but let's look at the di diplomacy. In the United States, after the coup, they have denounced um, on accounts of human rights and uh, going against democracy. This isn't new. Uh, this is something that had been going on in the past, but they have uh, revisited these uh, policies. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, perspective of China is uh, a hot potato issue. They have um, high stakes in it with the One Belt, uh, One Road policies with Xi Jinping visiting in January of 2020. And the official response is that Wang Wei, the foreign minister, have they have mentioned the three supporting cases and the three opposition cases. He also mentioned use communication and non-intervention clause as well as uh, that it is a hindrance to the UN Security Council. So this is actually the unjustified intervention mentioned by the UN Security Council. Council. So that's why they have officially mentioned this. The third one is actually the intervention of a third party or um, other countries, and they were mentioning the United States. A lot of the experiences and actions of the Korean government will probably be dealt with uh, by my next speaker, so I will just try to focus on the actions decided in April. So the deputy minister uh, talked with uh, the students and there were a lot of uh, policies for, to protect uh, overseas Koreans. But I believe that in Korea's perspective, a lot of the actions were quite rapid and fast. And the actual responses that were held out in uh, on March 12th in 2021 were quite substantial, considering all of the actions that were made and the results that they affected in. And the cases of violations, indiscriminations uh, as well, uh, were dealt with with caution and in a timely manner. I think that you see the escalation in the response from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, from the 2nd of February, 20th, 28th, uh, it escalates. Now what I would like to mention in the remaining time is what efforts the Korean government and the Korean diplomacy can do in the further in the future and of course our limitations some of the possibilities will uh, be divided into bilateral and multilateral in terms of bilateral diplomacy our government has always mentioned about the upholding of democracy as well as protecting minorities. There is a lot of female women and children that were affected by the coup. So protection of these vulnerable members are, is key. And regarding the 
actual effects um, that we can do in terms of the substantial policies regarding refugees as well as immigrants. We have about 30,000 Myanmar people in Korea. So this is uh, something that needs to be monitored, uh, and especially with uh, development cooperation businesses, we have to heighten the monitoring activities. And the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration was uh, declared in 2012, and this is actually focusing on the protection of children, teens, and women. Uh, in addition to the aggressive attacks on medical staff and the freedom of speech as well. And now moving on to the multilateral uh, diplomacy, this is something that will become an agenda even if uh, Korea does not take part in it. Um, it will be largely voiced. I believe that what's most re realistic is the response done by the ASEAN countries, um, pressuring uh, the Myanmar military as well as communicating with them. And regarding the restriction on information through digital authority, authority is one of uh, the things that we can voice our concerns on. Regarding civil uh, diplomacy, this isn't something that the government or the nation can uh, and push. It's more about a voluntary uh, action. And I think that this could sway both sides, and this will reflect the voluntary participation of the civil society as well as the people. I think that that would, should develop in that direction. Of course, there are some limitations and concerns with the prolonged uh, military coup. A lot of people are quite pessimistic about the future. There are three major areas. Uh, the prolonging of uh, the coup is one of them. In that case, the military will become very accustomed to uh, taking power, and they have no uh, means or requirements to stop. So this kind of suppression um, will continue, and there will be lessened interest in the civil society. Secondly, the economy, uh, economist also mentioned this, but um, talking about a failed uh, economy and failed democracy, especially with armed forces, uh, if that continues on, then it will uh, create more concerns. And with the internal uh, civil war continuing on, then it will become like Syria, a perpetual uh, crisis. Regarding the impunity and accountability, there have been a lot of requests in this field. And a lot of people are concerned that the impunity will instigate uh, the prolongation of uh, the coup. Then the military will have an impetus to continue on with uh, enforcing their power. So how to respond to these areas um, from the dipl diplomacy perspective as well as uh, the actual democracy perspective is uh, some of uh, the concerns that we have. And next, I would like to invite Mr. Hyunil Lee. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Hyunyeon Lee, uh, working for the Korea Democracy Foundation. And uh, here with us are many experts regarding this matter. So I'm not uh, the right person to make an evaluation of the overall situation of Myanmar. 
but I'd like to share with you uh, my uh, understanding of the attitude uh, taken by the general public of Myanmar and what kind of implications that can uh, we uh, can figure out from those uh, matters. Uh, next page, please. I got to know about Myanmar uh, back in 2010. At the time, actually, Myanmar was not quite an open uh, society or nation. Uh, so I approached the nation from the border of Thailand. And uh, for the first time uh, in uh, 2013, I uh, visited Myanmar. And uh, in the meantime, I met a lot of people, interviewing them. In the process, what I could figure out uh, commonly is that uh, Myanmar has a certain kind of unique uh, spirit of freedom, and also they value uh, basic dialogue with others. That's what I thought. And so as a Korean who was really um, quick-tempered uh, quick -tempered in terms of the uh, political issues. I was quite surprised to uh, meet them and have a talk with them. And I have um, gained uh, experiences uh, talking with uh, the representatives of the civil society organizations as well as uh, local residents. And uh, generally speaking, I would say that uh, they have the similar kind of public sentiment about politi poli politics. And especially after the recent coup, when I first um, heard uh, that uh, the coup took place, and uh, the military regime uh, responded to the protests of local residents in a viral manner, uh, so that's what I heard. So my expectation was that actually there was a lot of there will be a lot of, you know, uh, the conflict and uh, there will be a lot of tension escalated between the civil society and the coup. However, what actually happened was quite different from my expectation. For example, uh, in the initial stage, there were peaceful movements or peaceful demonstrations, but after some time, those peaceful uh, protests have gone away. So as of first, as of the first of February, the coup took place, and the first civilian victim was uh, occurred in uh, the sixth of. Uh, 2nd, 6th uh, of February, and also in uh, March, in early March, the current government made an official um, statement regarding that um, crisis. And uh, the reason why uh, the South Korean government um, issued an official statement right after the, uh, the coup is that uh, Myanmar was a kind of a public enemy in the international community because Myanmar was not uh, fully democratized yet. And uh, the military regime uh, received a lot of cri uh, criticisms uh, over the years. And second reason is that there, was a uh, there were clear cases of uh, human rights infringement. Uh, a lot of casualties um, took place. So that alone uh, was enough uh, to apply severe criticism by, um, of the international community, including South Korea. So um, looking at uh, the response of the South Korean government to external issues uh, like uh, China's uh, movement, uh, making a move uh, to wage war against Thai, uh, Taiwan, uh, the South Korean government this time actually made a very uh, strong uh, stance uh, on the coup issue. So South Korean government has been actively engaging in responding to the coup issue in Myanmar, and especially the members of the civil society of South Korea. Uh, they are um, building up solidarity among uh, civil members. And uh, here's the background why we uh, feel that, uh, feel why we feel 
until that what is happening in Myanmar was something close to us, and because of uh, our historical background, and we had candlelight vigil uh, revolution, and we went through the same process for democratization, just like Myanmar. Uh, so. There is a growing demand for democracy in Myanmar. And uh, so uh, the uh, urgent need for democracy is well felt uh, by the international community and emotionally uh, and psychologically uh, South Korean people are rooting for Myanmar citizens. And also there is a close link between South Korea and uh, Myanmar cases. Uh, so what they are going through at the moment uh, is bringing back our memories of uh, the May uh, uh, 18 democratization movement that we experienced here in Gwangju. So such uh, similarities between the two countries went uh, further with the recent coup uh, problem in uh, Myanmar. Uh, so in the city of Gwangju, uh, civil society members are uh, gathering more people to speak up uh, against the uh, military coup uh, in uh, Myanmar. So these are the four major points. So these are four elements that can characterize uh, of the uh, characterized response of the Korean civil society. First one is irreversible. So once something happens, uh, the things go in a uh, irreversible uh, manner. Uh, already after the coup, uh, many uh, changes are taking place. And uh, more and more with the introduction of uh, new, uh, new atmosphere, uh, the uh, many real estate places have become uh, more expensive than before. And after uh, the coup, what is happening in Myanmar is live streamed on uh, the social media or on uh, different uh, communication channels, so uh, it is meaningless to gloss over atrocities or things uh, that are happening in Myanmar in this new world, and uh, Myanmar citizens are already global citizens. And the second characteristic of uh, what is happening of, uh, in Myanmar is omnidirectional on a real-time basis. So what is happening in Myanmar is being communicated to the outside world in different languages. And third element or third characteristics of what is happening in Myanmar is integration or convergence. And uh, one of the protests that took place in Myanmar on uh, the 8th of March was based on Tamati and then used to certain ties to prevent uh, the access of the uh, military or political forces. And that was in line with uh, the International Women's Day. And so uh, that was more integrative uh, uh, character of uh, running uh, protest. And the uh, last uh, element is interactive uh, through SNS or through different uh, communication channels. You know, uh, the information uh, about uh, what is happening in Myanmar is being communicated in an interactive way. And things that happen in Myanmar are already covered through the different kinds of media just uh, in two or three days. So that is the uh, today's world that we uh, are living in. Uh, so uh, one of the weapons uh, that have been used by the citizens uh, can be uh, cell phones. Uh, however, even the cell phones are not usable anymore. Uh, internet connection is banned by the military regime. And uh, the military regime is uh, try trying to trace uh, back uh, those who are using the cell phones for communicating uh, what is happening to in uh, Myanmar to the outside world. And uh, emergency uh, supply or relief activities uh, are being banned because of the current situation. 
and uh, it seems not easy to uh, get an access to Myanmar citizens to help them. However, uh, what is true is that the real change is uh, happening in Myanmar. And uh, once things go better, I think that there will be more support by the international community for the country, just like uh, what happened in the early 2000s. Especially Korea has a lot uh, of role to play because we have a solid foundation of the civil society and now it's time for the government and for the Korean uh, civil society to, society to think about what to do for Myanmar. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, we had four panelists and we now have uh, two left um, for discussants. And I think that uh, Ms. Wei Noe Hin In So will be able to deliver her perspective as a <coughs> person uh, from Myanmar. Regarding the Myanmar democracy, I thank you once again for the four presenters. First, I would like to talk about the structural problems of the Myanmar uh, democracy and how the coup had come about. And he also mentioned a little bit about the history. Based on this, in terms of uh, the opposition or repression from the people, we have the CRPH um, that was uh, created as a result of the coup. There are uh, 17 National Assembly members. And in order for CRPH to be recognized and acknowledged by the international community, we really need to uh, pose the question of whether the federalism or federalism based democracy is possible. Because after Ne, ne Win took office in 1962, um, the minorities had lost their power and there had been a lot of uh, conflict among the different tribes. And so how CRPH will be able to coexist all together and bring everyone together is uh, the key issue. And secondly, a lot of people are placing expectations on CRPH. Then a lot of the younger generations uh, believe that there needs to be an allied forces or a combined forces. <laughs> so from the, the people's perspective, they have they cannot lose any more, and that's why they have to join hands with a CRPH and, of course, the minority uh, tribes uh, to contemplate whether um, they have a future forward. So I would like to pose these two questions. And now, um, Mr. Pei Hyun-jin. Uh, from the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Pei Hyun-jin in charge of the Division of uh, Southeast Asian Countries uh, under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, I was appointed to my position in February last year. And upon the appointment, I, appointment, I have been a lot of, uh, making a lot of efforts to improve the relations with Myanmar. And uh, these days, under the gov uh, government administrations, the new southern policies are priorities. And as part of those policy implementation, Myanmar is one of the important countries. So in a, a multifaceted way, we made an effort to improve relations with Myanmar. However, you know, all of a sudden, uh, this year in February, the coup, military coup happened. That is heartbreaking. So under the COVID-19 situation, uh, before the coup, uh, we shared um, information with each other about uh, what kind of preparation has been done for the general election. And on the day of general elections, we have uh, sent uh, our delegates uh, to uh, Myanmar so that uh, the Myanmar election uh, can be observed uh, by, uh, by us as well. 
and also we took photos of uh, the site at the polls. So we were proceeding uh, the things uh, that are needed to build uh, more relations, uh, bilateral relations between the two countries. And uh, some of the visits by high government officials were uh, scheduled as well. And since last year, uh, oh, that's the uh, kind of effort that we have been uh, making. However, uh, we could not see uh, the military coup coming uh, before the coup happened. Uh, so, but right before the coup, we could sense uh, something was going on. Um, so, as of uh, January 29th, uh, through the uh, local embassy that we have uh, in the country, a uh, public um, statement was issued in on the 29th of uh, January. And after that, uh, we, uh, our division has been in charge of um, overseeing the situation. Uh, or monitoring the situation uh, in uh, Myanmar. Uh, so we have categorized uh, what we have to do uh, into three, and uh, the government's uh, official position was expressed by the statement, official statement by the president, and a joint statement was also issued along with other relevant parties, and uh, through those, uh, we expressed our uh, official stance. We uh, called for uh, the stoppage of violence against protesters and also the release of the detainees uh, and so on. And uh, the diplomat, the Korean diplomat, um, also had a meeting with other diplomats um, to talk about uh, what needs to be done. And uh, also we had a meeting uh, together with those who are studying, uh, the Myanmar people who are studying in Korea to deep dive uh, the measures that we can take uh, so um, after that, uh, the South Korean government took uh, extra measures. So we decided to uh, stop the export of uh, items to uh, Myanmar. And so we did uh, take a follow-up measure. So at the moment, the ODA project was going on. Uh, so uh, on an annual basis, about $90 million of ODA project support uh, have uh, been uh, provided to Myanmar, but now we are under the review of uh, stopping the ODA project. Of course, you know, we cannot say clearly what kind of things will be stopped, but you know, we are under the review of uh, stopping some of the uh, projects uh, in Myanmar. And we um, also are uh, making sure to lengthen uh, the stay of uh, Myanmar citizens in here in Korea, uh, so their stay will be lengthened until the uh, Myanmar situation can be stabilized. And the next measure uh, that we thought of is to uh, protect Korean nationals or the, uh, the Koreans living in or staying in Myanmar, but with the worsening situations in the country, the Korean government has um, raised a warning uh, level, uh, so asking travelers or those who are staying in Myanmar uh, to come back uh, from the country. But in order for them to come back to Korea, they need flights. But uh, since last year, uh, between the governments, there has been an agreement to run more um, flights between the two countries. Uh, so um, on a weekly basis, we are uh, trying to add one more flight uh, per week so that uh, more Koreans uh, from uh, Myanmar can come back to the home country. So we have a special uh, central division in charge of the Myanmar uh, monitoring uh, Myanmar situation. So uh, we will uh, wait and see how things go. It is hard to uh, predict anything uh, for sure. 
So at the moment, you know, we are pondering over, you know, what needs to be done, and uh, we are contemplating uh, things um, that are needed. But uh, in the international uh, community, of course, South Korea will make a further effort to uh, improve uh, the situation in Myanmar. So what matters most is the stability, the safety, and the welfare of uh, citizens in Myanmar. Uh, so uh, we need to uh, live up to the expectations of Myanmar people for democracy. So to that end, the South Korean government will make uh, further efforts. So um, I'd like to thank you for your insights uh, presented uh, in the seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We had uh, the two discussants and the four presentations. So we have uh, quite a few questions on the monitor, so I will try to group those questions and deliver uh, to uh, the right recipient. First of all, for Professor Park, uh, when you uh, delivered your presentation, you also mentioned that uh, in order to for change, we need to have defectors from the military. Is, is there a possibility of uh, uh, defectors uh, trying to go against uh, Hun Lying, uh, the head of the military? And if you think about CRPH, is the acknowledgement of the international community conducive to creating defectors in the military? That's the second question. And the third question is there's a lot of concerns over uh, the militia uh, coming out from the minorities. And these militia will probably get um, calls from the military as well as um, calls from the democratic movement. So there are these militia in the, or the rebel forces. Um, who do you think they will uh, ally with? So these are the three questions for you, Professor Park. Um, I'd first like to answer the question from uh, Ms. Wei Noe. The same goes for uh, Thailand, the neighboring country to Myanmar. One of the critical factors is national reconciliation. Under this crisis situation, the, in the past, the Aung San Suu Kyi administration really um, spoke about uh, the various human rights issues like the Rohingya uh, issue and as well as uh, some other violations. So this was led by the Admiral Aung San and of course the Long Hae. I think that using or leveraging on this situation, the CRPH will be able to defend and support the minority uh, groups and create a federalism democracy. And if they can create a constitution and the federalist democracy, I think that that will also add to upgrading uh, the current democracy of Myanmar. In media outlets have also announced that the CDM 
A lot of Rohingyas are participating in this uh, movement, and a lot of the people have, are now empathizing with uh, the Rohingya and what they went through. So I think that that will uh, provide an impetus to uh, CRPH and their global recognition. So at the moment, I think that it looks quite bleak, but um, I think we can be optimistic about uh, a better uh, future. After uh, gaining independence uh, in, in 1948, that uh, national reconciliation that is required for a true democracy, uh, I think might be the first step to moving into uh, true democracy. And then I think the international community will also help in that endeavor. Regarding the minority group, uh, rebel groups, they are those, uh, the, the ones that are registered under the NCA are 10 uh, minority groups. And the rebels that have acceded to NCA have officially uh, announced their opposition to the coup. And like the Waha tribe who have not uh, acceded to the NCA are closely related to China. But they're quite vague in their actions, and they have been ambiguous in their position. I think that there is a difference of opinion. But I, I think it's very risky to say that they are, all have a difference in opinion among the minority groups. Um, they mostly support the CRPH. But if you think about the CRPH and um, it's really going to be a critical factor as to how much the government accepts the voices and opinions of uh, the minority groups and whether uh, their voices are heard and implemented. I think that that will be a critical factor. And as for the defector issue, Ultimately, I think uh, that in 1988, there was a movement of the people power. And Ramos at the time, who was uh, the Minister of Defense, he stepped down and people power uh, was succeeded in overturning uh, the military power. It won't be easy because there's um, a, a sort of a monolithic uh, aspect to it. However, if the international community is persistent in suppressing the Myanmar's military power. Under this current scenario, if it uh, develops into an internal uh, civil war, then everything will be lost. It will be a lose-lose situation for all. So regarding this kind of implosion scenario, the international community must uh, suggest and try to persuade uh, them to turn into a more favorable direction. Up until now, our government has been pursuing a lot of valuable efforts. However, there's a lot of um, hacking incidents that have been happening in Myanmar, and one of the names are POSCO and POSCO International, POSCO Steel. And 
It's already been noted um, among the civil society that these companies have been providing funds to the military. I think that we do need to have a specific guideline for these measures. Thank you very much. Um, I actually asked uh, this question to uh, Mr. Pei from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Korea is not um, one of the major importers or exporters uh, with uh, Myanmar. And so, of course, it is in the top 10, but it does not have a lot of substantial uh, trade with them. We don't have much leverage with in education, but in terms of gas and mining, uh, we might have a substantial trade relation. But I think that I would like to hand that over to Mr. Pei. Uh, I'd like to address the questions asked by Professor Park. We are aware of the issue. And after the declarations by the military regime of the state of the crisis and the emergency, uh, we at the ministry level communicated closely with uh, the concerned uh, Korean companies uh, that you mentioned about. Even before February 1st, there were concerns. There were concerns raised uh, over those Korean companies who have some engagement with uh, military-related uh, the companies in Myanmar, and uh, and uh, even more uh, suggestions are being made uh, after the military coup. Uh, so that's a matter that we are working on. And also, what I want to tell you is that. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that for the things that uh, we cannot um, acknowledge or allow, uh, we need to uh, make it clear to the Korean companies. So we are on a continuous uh, dialogue and conversation with Korean companies. And uh, for example, the uh, POSCO is a private, was privatized back in 2000, and so it's not a public uh, company any longer. And uh, the POSCO uh, has, been, has been working with uh, the company in Myanmar based on a certain contract signed in the past. So I'd like to uh, give a question to another panelist. In case of a democracy uh, in Myanmar going into a failure, what impact would it have on the international scene, uh, not only not just on the regional scene? Uh, for example, even before the uh, recent coup, that was uh, anti-Chinese sentiment, and after the coup, Re regarding the stance taken by China, many of the Myanmar citizens were uh, dissatisfied with China. So that further sparked more anti-Chinese sentiment. But China is um, in pursuit of one belt and one road, and even Aung, uh, Ms. Aung San Suu Kyi had close relations with China. So uh, when in the context of the international political scene, what impact would uh, Myanmar situation bring about? It could be uh, labeled as the solution of Myanmar events and, of course, um, the relations between U.S. and China. Even with the Biden administration, I think that they have difficulty in mentioning or announcing their position regarding this issue. If this becomes a failure, uh, what kind of impacts will it have on the international policy? political scene. Um, I think regarding this coup, a lot of the international issues, even with the foreign minister of Singapore also mentioned in the past, that the most realistic way is to persuade the military. 
분명히 그 총선은 이제 공정한 총선이 되지 않을 거. I mean, the the general election probably will not be a completely fair and equitable election. But in order to stop the bloodshed and to follow in the footsteps of what China has mentioned, I think that there that it might be a realistic view. A lot of the governments mentioned the various different stakeholders um, about regarding the democracy upheld by the U.S. Because there is no kind of vested interest, it's very difficult to apply this to the U.S.-China relations. A lot of the realistic viewers mentioned those points. One of my concerns is if this is protracted or it becomes prolonged or if it becomes or morphs into a civil war. Those are some of my immediate concerns, but so, uh, the silver lining is that the international discussions and various human rights protections issues and policies that uphold accountability and a lot of the civil vo uh, organizations' voices in the United States are becoming louder. Then with that, I think that the United States might be able to put more pressure on the situation. And now, next question to uh, Mr. Taehyun Lee. And China and some other countries are saying that actually the democracy issue in Myanmar needs to be dealt with uh, among themselves. Uh, and some ASEAN countries um, issued a statement. However, you know, that was not an active uh, stance um, to tackle, enough to tackle uh, the situations of uh, Myanmar. So uh, the question is uh, the in relation to the ties with Thailand. And Thailand is the second biggest uh, exporter to uh, Myanmar. And in case of the uh, refugees, uh, there are already issues between the two nations. So if there are um, refugees from Myanmar in the future, would uh, the Thailand government accept uh, those refugees? So uh, please um, express yourself. Uh, thank you for the questions. And uh, there were several questions in relation to ASEAN. So, um, so ASEAN uh, is advocating for welfare and democracy. However, when you look at more details uh, of inside of ASEAN, they first put uh, non-interruption first uh, for the reason of respecting other countries' uh, uh, sovereignty. So ASEAN countries actually, they think that um, it is not in their violation of the ASEAN Charter because even the ASEAN Charter actually, they advocate for the respect of the sovereignty, meaning non-interruption -interru interventions. And uh, looking back, the role of ASEAN was uh, weak whenever there were issues and problems in uh, one of the uh, ASEAN countries and uh, they did not take any active stance or active measures to tackle those problems. And uh, ASEAN, rather than uh, cons being concerned about their relations, internal relations with ASEAN uh, member countries, they are more concerned about uh, their relations uh, with uh, the international community or uh, the outside uh, world. So that's the limitations that ASEAN has. And uh, when it comes to relations with Thailand, there have been issues um, in many numbers between the, between the two countries because there were some um, movements of the uh, armed uh, forces between uh, along with the uh, national borders of the two countries. 
But the Thailand government had an elections and under the Thailand constitution, the military regime in Thailand, they took power. But uh, in Myanmar, the military regime, they just uh, started uh, the coup. Um, so for the situation uh, in uh, Myanmar, the Thailand military regime uh, uh, cannot speak up because they are in the same club, kind of same club. So that's the situation going on. I have uh, two questions for Ms. Lee. As a uh, Korean citizen, I want to help uh, the democratization of Myanmar. How can I help? And the next question is, um, in the disobedience movement, uh, I think that there, it naturally will morph into a violent and um, movement. If what would be the pros and cons of a violent movement and a non-violent movement? I had no uh, time to present this part, but in Myanmar. There is a civil, civil activist, and he sent me a short video. And according to him, Korean civil society is uh, supporting Myanmar, and uh, the Myanmar people know that uh, the Korean civil society uh, is placing more efforts. And even with the military, um, they do have a lot of fear regarding the power of the military that they're wielding. Um, in every stage of democratization, with, whenever there is a request for democracy, the powers from China and Russia have been avid supporters of the military power. So that's why um, the democratization movements always resulted in failure, and I'm sure that they're still heavily dependent on China and Russia. The civil movement will continue on. However, with more sacrifices going down the road, uh, it will become more challenging and more difficult. And they also asked for the Korean civil society to continue on relentlessly in their support uh, so that the people in Myanmar will be able to continue on. I also mentioned about the civil war situation. Of course, at the moment, it's not uh, eminent, but if you think about other tribes, uh, other ethnicities apart from Burma, Usually it would be um, a conflict between other tribes and uh, Burmese people. And it is a growing concern um, that the different ethnicities will turn on each other. If it, is it going to be continuously a nonviolent protest or is it going to turn into a violent protest? We cannot be, say for sure, but the civil society will continue on to request for a peaceful uh, step down. If they get support, I think that they will be able to regain their energy and continue on in their fight. We agree with that, and uh, people of Myanmar also think so. But I think that everyone has the conviction in their hearts that they will succeed and they will win over. Rather than having a direct uh, influence or effect. I'm not sure how uh, this is from the government's perspective, but focused on the civil society. If we can create different funds to uh, support the future generation uh, for Myanmar, I think that that could also help out. Like the uh, Myanmar Democracy Network or um, Solidarity for Myanmar, 
These networks and associations have been continuously supporting Myanmar and their fight. So you can probably join them uh, uh, to make your contributions. Thank you very much. This is my personal uh, question for Mr. Pei of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In fact, the South Korean government issued an official uh, statement and also uh, took measures um, extra measures uh, against the situation in Myanmar. So this is really welcoming. So uh, I uh, personally thought that it was a good move. But uh, my question is about uh, multilateralism. What about you know uh, putting this as an agenda on, on AMF? And, uh, but what about um, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan? Uh, so with these countries, probably we can form a kind of multilateral system so that uh, these countries, including Korea, can serve as a coordinator to resolve the issue in Myanmar. And another thing is that you know, why don't we uh, look at not just um, Asia, but also uh, the other part of the world. For example, there is uh, the the Korea is a member of uh, the Drive for Democracy. You know that uh, association is um, involved with European countries. So have you ever um, thought about you know having this kind of multilateral system in place? So regarding the issue of Myanmar, uh, with uh, what kind of country should we consult or what kind of uh, multilateralism we need to apply, uh, these kind of things were not you know, thought out in details. But vice minister or ministers, when they had to have the opportunities to talk with uh, overseas counterparts, um, they uh, bring up the issue of Myanmar in the context of the international uh, scene or as well as in the context of the regional uh, scene. So uh, it is clear, uh, it can be clearly said that uh, Myanmar is one of the important agenda that we are working on. And um, uh, I'd like to um, take your suggestions and we will uh, review your suggestions for the future. So uh, I'd like to uh, ask questions to the Luen Hue. So this is my last question. So I would like to ask everyone on this panel. So while living in Korea, by living in Korea ever since uh, February 1st, I have been acti act being an activist here in Korea whenever I, I, whenever I can. Whenever I go to lectures, um, usually I was always hopeful in uh, shouting out that we can achieve a, a democracy. But as was mentioned, there's over 700 casualties. And of course, there is the CA, CRPH, but then whether the Gen Z has to uh, hold hands with the allied forces or whether um, there will be punishment for the military. There's a lot of casualties and sacrifices and um, recently with the Rohingya issue. I think that this is um, something that we cannot just go over and regarding the punishment. This is also a, a big dilemma for us. And under these circumstances, in particular by representing the younger generation, and this non-obedience um, fight from the civil society uh, has been going on for about two months. Uh, there's a question about whether it can continue. And even three are being detained against their will. And it's, it's kind of 
like going through a long tunnel without no end. At first, I was very hopeful and uh, speaking as if uh, we can overcome this, but at the moment, it seems like uh, a closed issue without any end. And so how shall, should we overcome and how should we negotiate? And I, I'm kind of in despair right now, but how should we become more optimistic? So I'd like to ask every one of you on that. Uh, I don't have a lot of time left right now, but about uh, out of the 740 casualties, a big portion is uh, in the age of 20 to 39 percent, with 40 percent, uh, 20 to 39 in terms of age. 40 percent of the 740 casualties are in this uh, younger generation. And I think that it's the younger generation that really needs to voice their concerns. And in order for that, I think that under such circumstances with the politics not being advanced and how the civil society is still struggling, we can't really trust the vested interests. So I would like to ask these two uh, questions. I do truly empathize with uh, your uh, questions. Um, I think that all standing up and raising three fingers to express solidarity with uh, the Myanmar uh, civilians, I think that will express our support. Um, so I hope that you will join me in making this gesture. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now uh, take our seats. Well, thank you once again for your time and your valuable insight today. I hope that, or I think that all uh, Koreans are heartbroken uh, over the coup and the issues. And I hope that the violence will stop and the road to democracy will open again. Even under these uh, difficult circumstances, I hope that the Korean government will be able to provide uh, political support as well as solidarity from the civil society. I think that this is a huge learning for us as well. Our value diplomacy, uh, demo democratic uh, cooperation, I think that this, these are all valuable experiences for us. Thank you once again for your uh, input, and we will continue on in the discussion. Thank you very much. And with this, we will uh, conclude the conference today. Thank you very much.